The message you're about to listen to is a message from Apostle Eric Nyamiche, the chairman of the Church of Pentecost. Apostle Eric Nyamiche preaches the gospel in its simplest form to help the believers walk in Christ and also how the believer relate with his world. This year, the message is on unleashing the church to possess nation. Join us and let's learn from Apostle Eric Nyamiche and be a blessing to the world. If you are new to this page, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on that notification bell so that when new videos are uploaded, you can have access to it. Make sure you go to our own page and check out for more videos. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, well, I just grew up in a, in a, in a missionary family. So I, I knew about um, missions. And uh, it was very simple. I went to, to, to um, Bible school and then I just had the opportunity of taking on a small church and revitalizing it. And so we did that. And then 10 years ago, um, I got the opportunity to start from zero again, go to Eastern Germany, start with nothing, um, had to raise some money to become a missionary in my own country. And within the last 10 years, we have just planted six churches and started some other churches, and I've built up a training situation. And um, it's, it's not really a, a big strategy behind it. It's just um, being a bit naive and just doing what I felt God was calling me to do. And I believe if we, if we do what God calls us to do, God will take care of us and he is faithful and he has taken care of us so now I don't just raise my own salary as a missionary but I'm also raising money to pay some other people to we're we're, we're financing um, some mission works and it's just by the grace of God it's just starting and believing to do what God has called us to do and maybe the biggest secret uh, other than the Holy Spirit is to have a great wife supporting you. That's it. Yes. Our, our elder, please, Felix, tell oh, us. Thank you, thank you. Um, uh, the chairman said something yesterday that when God chooses you, he won't allow you to fail. For me, I haven't done anything extraordinary, but I think that God just chose me. He just decided to choose me and then make it happen. So, um, and I also want to thank God for the parents I had. They did a lot of work for God. They were supporting the church, they were doing things, and we learned it from them. So maybe God just decided that they are old, so the blessing should come to the children. And then <laughs> they are enjoying it. So, yeah, so for me, that, that is how I see it. Um, and the other thing is that when God starts doing that in your life, then you have to go back to the manual and stick to the manual, which is the word of God. So that the things are coming, you're enjoying it, you are going up, but then your manual is the Bible. So we go back to the Bible and the Holy Spirit directs you. My boss said something, Dr. Japon, he said that, you see, when you're able to differentiate between good and bad, then you make it. So when you go into the Bible, you know what you have to do and what you are not to do. Once you know that, God will continue blessing you. So that's how I've made it. It's just by the grace and I think I've been chosen. That's all. Thank you. Oh, that's powerful. Prof, please. Many thanks, special thanks to our chairman executives and also the planning committee for the wonderful opportunity for all of us to participate in this panel discussion. My story, um, I place it along two lines. I think the family upbringing contributed a lot to my development and the second category is the church upbringing. It will interest you to know that I had a dad, well, he's gone to glory. When you have scored 80% in a class and you are first, you come home expecting to be praised, oh, wow, you've done very well. But his response is, what happened to the remaining 20%? Uh -huh. He doesn't end there. He goes further to explain its practical reality. What he's saying is that, look, he will ask you the question, what do you want to become in the future? Those days I was, I want to be a medical doctor after some time when I knew I was struggling in biology a bit and stronger in mathematics, I moved to engineering. But in each of these scenarios, he would explain to you that, look, if you decide to be a medical doctor and you are to treat 100 patients and you are scoring 80% now, 
it means that you are likely to get 20% of the patients wrongly diagnosed. I mean, literally, as he took it, he will move it also to the engineering field and say, say you build engines or construct bridges. Can you imagine 20 bridges collapsing? Of course, it's an oversimplified understanding of life, but that pushed me to ensuring that there was excellence in every endeavor that I was taking. My mother was deeply spiritual. So you can see that from my father's side, there was a bit of hard work, excellence, try for excellence, and you, can't, you just have to be the best of yourself. Of course, not competing with others, but you need the best version of yourself. And my mother's side was more of the deep spiritual things, prayer, fasting, studying the word of God. So I grew up by the grace of God, holding two things in my hands, in one hand, excellence, academic stuff, and that is why maybe I dwelt in the science and the academy for a very long time. Then the other hand, also deeply spiritual. So a balance of faith and also science. Not only that, you always need an environment to bring you up. So outside the family upbringing, the church environment was my enabling uh, environment. Let me put it that way. Because our fathers, though we were very young, granted us opportunity. At the age of 23, I was an elder leading a uh, very big church, leading ministries here and there. You make mistakes, you are called home, you are trained. Especially our pastor's wives, our deaconesses, and uh, the other leaders, they will invite you home coach you, mentor you, and grant you opportunity next time. Look, I one time preached, and when I sat back, I knew it was a big mess, big, big mess. But the district pastor just invited me and said, hey, we don't say these things on the platform. Next time you've got to. So there's been this kind of training and mentorship from that perspective, and I'm very grateful to God. Even to the extent that now, as young as I am, our fathers honored us by placing us in the role of a vice chancellor, which is something that I cherish so much. So I give the emphasis to family upbringing the church and the love that our fathers continuously have shown to us by granting us opportunity, which have enabled us to come to where we, we are now. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Please, Reverend Wachi, what's your story behind thank this you. success? I am still evolving in my development, I, I would say, but to be quite honest with you, I like to say that um, my story is a story of grace. I think uh, Professor Kodia's story about his mother and his father resonates very much with me. I, I won the lottery of life by being born to a deaconess of the Church of Pentecost. And that alone is a gift that I am always grateful for. Because that spiritual foundation and being brought up in the church, my father was an economic immigrant, so he left Ghana in 1984. And so I was raised by my mother and the elders of the Church of Pentecost. And that spiritual environment, that mentorship, that investment of time and love, just, I knew my father loved me, and he does. But I think the people on the ground who invested the time to get to know us and to nurture us. I remember my first biggest accomplishment in life was that in 1992, uh, I won the Ashanti Regional Pentecost Sunday School Quiz. Now, to this day, I, I count that certificate as probably one of my biggest accomplishments in life. But the, the, the man of God who led me and trained me and prepared me for that is an apostle of the church now in the USA. Apostle Lam Ponce in California. Now I say this because it is that environment that begins to shape. And I, every time I speak to my generational cohort and to young people, I tell them that the biggest gift that, anybody, that God has given to them is the fact that they have known God at an early stage in life. And so because of that, I, 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 I managed by the grace of God to avoid all the trivialities of young adulthood. And so people used to say that you are young, but you have an old soul. And I didn't quite know what that meant. But I think it reflected in the story that I was telling you before. By the grace of God, when I came out of university in 2003, God opened up a massive door. I didn't, at the time, I didn't realize it. 
But even before then, let me take a step back. In 1997, which was two years after I got to America, I was only 16 years at the time, a company came looking for young people. Don't forget, Windows 95 came in 1995. So the technological revolution in America started in 95, at the time that I arrived in the USA as a 14-year-old young man. And so when I arrived, I realized I had an interest, and so I started taking a typing class. And then a company that was looking to modernize its systems because the older folks couldn't keep up with the new technology that was coming up. And so the company was looking for young interns, just like Dr. Japon is looking to do now, they were looking for young interns that could be mixed and kind of matching them up with the older generational workers and helping them to adapt to how to use a printer, how to use a mouse, how to click on the internet. And so I volunteered for it without any knowledge about computers. But I told them that I am decently smart, I write well, and I can type. So they hired me. But I say this because I stepped into the breach when I didn't know that I was capable. And then the hiring director, at that time, they picked four people, and by the grace of God, I was one of the four. When we got there, my father came to visit the company just to check out because he didn't believe that I had actually gotten this internship. So he went and he saw the HR director. And the HR director told my father that, sir, we have found a diamond in the rough. I didn't understand what he meant, and my, frankly, my father didn't quite understand it either. But it wasn't until after the summer ended and all the interns were let go but then they asked me to go back and ask if my parents would allow me to come back and work after school three days a week. Beloved, I'm telling you this because this is an act of grace. I'm sitting here as a product of Pentecostal grace. And so from the age of 16, from the age of 16, I had my own office at a computer company in Alexandria, Virginia. And I would go there after school on Mondays and I would hang out with these vice presidents and presidents and they took me in as their own son. They taught me how to navigate the halls of power, how to, how, to, how to sit in a room and absorb knowledge. And so by the time I got to college, I already had about five years of corporate experience. By the time I graduated from university, applying for a job with just a college undergraduate degree, I was able to get a job as a consultant to USAID. And beloved, the rest is history. Now, when USAID hired me, Within two years, and I'm saying all of this to motivate somebody out there. And all this time, when I got this job, they started sending me to Africa to oversee the project that I had been assigned, working with banks. Now, imagine a 23-year-old young African man still kind of think I'm daydreaming. I would go to Zambia, and I would sit there with banks, and they know that I represent the U.S. government in this conversation. So the African old men don't understand why is this young man talking to us, but we need him. At the end of the day, at the end of the day, I'll work and I'll do my reports. And then on the weekends or in the evenings, I, won't, I don't have anywhere to go. I don't have any interest in going to see animals, because frankly, Africans, how many of us go to see animals? No, we don't. And so I would, I would find out if there's a Pentecost missionary in the country. I remember Apostle Ando, I think he's retiring this year. He was in Zambia at the time. I would go visit with him, and I would absorb knowledge from these men of God. Apostle Ahen, he was in Malawi. I, go, I spent a whole day with him. This is a 23-year-old young man, and I was tapping into spiritual insight. I didn't know. I was just hanging out with men that I enjoyed hanging out with. But God was using it to shape me. Amen. But beloved, I say all of this, that over the years... When every door would close, because I was invested and I cared about the things I believed that God cared about, he would always open a door. I came into government in the first George Bush, George G.W. Bush administration in 2000 and 2003. I came on as a direct hire of the U.S. government. And I say this to the grace of God, that they hired and brought me on at a time when PhDs were not even allowed to be hired by the government, because those of you who know American politics, when the Republicans come in, one of the first things they do is that they stop all government hiring. But God opened a way for me after I made a massive contribution in terms of a donation and an offering. And I believe the Lord God has used these opportunities to really shape me. Now I serve as a bivocational minister of the church. 
And I would go to these countries. I recently I was in a, in a country, I wouldn't name it. I've met with a gentleman who is a US dollar billionaire. And he took me to a restaurant. And he was looking for us to do a program together. Now, before we even sat down, he asked me, this was right after Easter. He asked me, how was your weekend? I was telling him, well, I'm a minister, so my weekends are very busy. The gentleman, this is a 77-year-old gentleman, very distinguished gentleman. He says, oh, yes, I know. I watched your sermon. Beloved, this is the first time that my vocational profession and my calling as a minister came to a head. All of a sudden, I felt naked and proud at the same time. Because I knew that he had gone ahead of me and done due diligence to know that he's dealing with a man of integrity. That actually gives me currency in that conversation. And so afterwards, after we were done, we spent about five hours in meetings. He was driving me back to my hotel. And he said, you know, that's the same one you gave. That was really powerful. And then the Spirit of God said, this is your time to plant the gospel seed. And so I said, I, 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 I planted the seed. And I said, you know what? You're looking for a legacy. But I can assure you that the only legacy that lasts is the eternal one. And then the man, the man was quiet. And then he started talking about all the other business. I was thinking about you, Dr. Japon. Because I wanted to link you up with him. The point that I'm making is that at that moment, the next day I want to see the pastor in that country. And I said, let us pray about this man. Because if he, we're able to get a, a city church established, and we can invite him as a member. And I will make sure to invite him. It will transform our church in that country. May God bless this initiative. Amen. So powerful. God bless you. God bless you. Lorraine Wright Burton. Lorraine, she's a woman of power. She's so humble, but so powerful. She even received the highest order of honor uh, by Her Majesty. She has an MBE by Her Majesty because of the work that she does and the lives that she impacts in the communities. So, Lorraine, it's an honor to have you on the panel. So, please tell us, how did you get to be where you are? Thank you. And to the Chairman, to the Planning Commission, the Elders, especially Elder Elvis, thank you very much for inviting me here. I feel like a bit of a, bit of a fraud. I'm not a Church of Pentecost member. That is my disclaimer. I am a product of Trinity Baptist Church in London, and um, but have been in and around the Church of Pentecost and absolutely love um, what we stand for here. Very similar to what was mentioned earlier on with the Chairman, when you are called, when God calls you, he won't leave you. He won't fail you. And I love that. And um, for me, I see that I've been a product of my parents as well as my church community. Um, for those that don't know, to, for a little bit of context, what I run is, um, I guess, one of, alongside Pencer in the UK, one of the largest platforms for gospel choirs at universities in the UK. And that is something that God called me to do. He said that he wants to take universities for his kingdom. And he wanted to do that through me, through gospel choirs. So what I do is I establish gospel choirs on campuses across the UK and I bring them together and we have um, a celebration and a competition and that's something that we've been doing for the last 12 years to God's glory. And um, thank you. The, the, the way I started that was my mum was, um, you know, she, she was a member of the Methodist church. She was a singer there wasn't the best singer in her choir. In fact, if she was singing here right now, you'll probably all vacate the arena. That grace fell on me too. And uh, I like to sing. I love, I love the mass choir that sung earlier on today as well. I absolutely love choirs. That is my ministry. And that is what God has called me to do. And I see that that is the way I love what was spoken about earlier on around diversity and the power of diversity. Because in a choir, not only have you got different voices, you've not only got different colors and creed, you've got different voices as well. And when they come together to God's glory, it's so powerful. 
And, you know, that is something that um, I, I've just loved choirs, I've loved ministry, I've loved being able to use a voice and provide a platform for singers to be able to sing unto God's glory and use that as their outlet through the arts. And that's something that I've done, for the, as I said, for the last 12 years. And God, similarly, I love that, what you've spoken about, but God won't leave you. And he's let doors open the fact that we can influence the marketplace and go into corporates and go into schools and do the things and you know we've been called by you know shows like in the UK Britain's Got Talent and the X Factor because they need gospel choirs to come on their TV shows and that's because I was humble enough to answer God's call that he wanted to establish gospel choirs on every campus everywhere so that's a little bit about my story that's so touching and so powerful. The youth are the future. And being placed in the universities and interacting with the youth is a powerful mission. Uh, Doc, I don't even know where to start with you. Okay. How did you get to be where you are? Okay, because you. many of us, when we hear about money, we say, ah, that's the devil. Ah, I bind money. Ah, that's the devil. How did you get out of this mentality that we have that many of us don't want to deal with money or we look at success from the money point of view like something that's not useful? So tell us, how did you transform your mindset? Because many of us, we need a change in our mindset, in how we view money in how we view the resources that God has given us. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I will humbly describe myself as Joseph, the village boy who Jesus found him. Joseph, the village boy whom Jesus found him. I was born in a village, in a mad house, Actually, my mother informed me that I was born in a farm. He'd gone to a farm, um, trying to cut some food, and then he, she was in labor. And then so she had to be assisted. And so from that background of information, I know that if it has not been Jesus, I couldn't have been alive as a day. Born in the village, came to the city, went back to the village for school completed education no farms fortunately all the introduction you did you mentioned degrees mba i don't have one <laughs> i don't have a degree i don't have an mba as for my life it's a full testimony when i see myself here even in this hall I consider it as a highest privilege because a village boy do not appear here. <laughs> Villagers don't see light like this. <laughs> My father married three wives, 17 children. I am the fifth of the 17 children. A very large family. Someone informed my father that going to farming is the best. So he sold all his items as a photographer and then went into farming. Unfortunately, one day, in fact, he moved all the 17 children and the three wives into a village. Where farming when one day a cocoa farm caught fire. And the whole farm, palm plantations, went off. So we have come back to the beginning of life. All of us were no school. I could remember seriously that it got to a time that I have to be a laborer, go to weed for people's farm, or cut food for people's farm. And they paid us. And when they are paying, they don't pay you by money. They pay you by some of the food staff. So you go and weed, let's say, an acreage of cocoa yam. Then the woman will take some of the cocoa yam and pay you because she hasn't got money. When we came back, 
by God's grace to the city. I never knew any church. I've never been anywhere. At the age of 15, schooling, I completed my education. My father hasn't got money. I told my mother, no money. So I ended. That was the end. One day, my father asked me, he said with me, that go and support your mommy at selling SSI bus. I was, I wept because I thought my end and my destiny. The most painful thing was that in the morning when I come from the house and see my colleagues, students, taking their boxes to school and I am at home because no money. I thought the destiny has come to end. So I wept every day, every second. Until one day, I heard a voice, Obey thy father and mother, and it shall be well with you. So I obeyed, supported my mother at the shop, and I have tried, I walk on the street, tried every business, selling jewelries, uh, every business I'll try. Selling, put things on my head, at market stations, and trying it up. Until one day, my mommy took me to church of Pentecost, 31st night. And then I lifted my hands, accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and personal Savior. And the Lord, through my mother, burned me up. Then the rest, Jesus took over my life. And continued in his own way that all the businesses that I've done, and people of God, the businesses that I've done, when I pray, then it drops. When it drops, the Holy Spirit will move me with a severe force until it is accomplished. I will not be restless. So none of the businesses have done a business plan, a strategy section, feasibility and viability, <laughs> SWOT analysis, none. Like this building, I say I will build. I will build. <laughs> as far as my eyes can see, the Holy Spirit will help me to interpret it. And you see when Daniel chapter 5 verse 12 when Belshazzar saw a handwriting on the wall and he couldn't. They say go and call Daniel. He's able to interpret dreams and riddles. As far as the Holy Spirit allow me to see something and then it comes. So my life, in fact, I want to just add this. My wife that I married was very beautiful more than me. And we were in the same church. And I never even want to close to her, go close to her because she's very beautiful and I am afraid even to propose to her. <laughs> I wear chalewote and she is very... So I fear to go to her. My life has been so very, very in poverty that when I see money, I want to run away. The day I proposed to her, I could remember the words. I said to her that we were walking after church and then I went close to her that and do you know the words I used? I said, if God permits, we can be together. That, that is the only word. Because I am afraid even to say that I will marry you because I don't. Need. And God in his own wisdom. And that is why since Jesus found me, I have come closer to him by chasing him that the day I will leave him, that will be my end of my life. Thank you. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. 
that's so so touching and encouraging and in fact you've answered so many of the questions that the audience have asked because some were saying that you're just concentrating on universities and and academic hey what about us that maybe that's not our portion maybe we haven't gone through the journey lack of education should not be a limitation to anyone we've seen our dog what he has just said and the one factor that i've taken from that like i think it was um apostle was talking about the holy spirit we need him we cannot do vision 2028 we cannot transform our front lines we cannot conquer our spheres of influence without the holy spirit so thank you so much um i've got a few questions that the audience have posted uh, i'll bring some of the audience questions and then we'll ask one or two questions as well so one of the questions are similar it's asking about uh, men how do you balance being a husband and doing the things that you do and someone has also asked a question to Lorraine which is similar to say how do you balance being a woman and do all the things that you do so it's a question of how do you travel in your journey of success but being a father being a a husband being a wife being a mother and also being a pastor being a priest in your workplaces so how do you balance all these competing um demands upon your life uh do you ever sleep at night what time do you wake up <laughs> do you rest or is it 24 hours on the clock so any of the panelists can start should i give it a go right i think this this question comes directly at me because dr chen sometimes i wonder 24 hours whether if i beg god he will add extra hours uh, to to wait but i'll just share with you how i feel and how i go around around this growing up in the church there's been instances where I was the presiding elder, the district secretary, area executive member, electoral commissioner, national trustee. I mean, my pastors are here. A lot of them agree with that, Dr. Deborah, Dr. Elom Donko, Apostle A.B., and there are previous national heads in, in Europe. So you clearly know what I'm talking about. So at one point in time, you are in a district executive meeting the next moment there were instances i was also handling by god's grace top level european projects so i'll be traveling from the uk to brussels most of the time from brussels sometimes to germany here especially at stuttgart in the Fraunhofer projects going beyond that you may be in italy spain or any of these places i would have to arrive maybe friday i will intentionally book the flight so that by five ish i'm at the airport because as a presiding at those days in leicester i would have to be in church by seven so right from the airport i will have to get to church i would arrange with my wife to bring their case we will meet at church and you can imagine you've been away for weeks but the first time you are seeing your family is at church just bear with me i'm developing something so that carried on with me for a very long time and those who were very close with me were even concerned saying that no you've got to have time for family have time for children you've got to do this you've got to do that and one day a minister wrongly preached one of them wrongly at a meeting over emphasized this and i remember what one of our colleagues did he called a meeting on saturday and he just responded pastor i can't make it because i've got to take my kids to the park then the next time it was Sunday, I said, no, I've been very busy the whole week. Therefore, this Sunday I'm taking it off. Then I prompted him that there is a better way of doing this. Make your wife. And if it's a woman, make your husband. Make your children part of what you are doing. Let them love it. Let them see that as their whole world. There were instances where families were concerned that 
we've got to leave here so that we can go and celebrate birthdays and other things. Then I held a view and I encouraged them that, look, the church is the best place to celebrate these things. Can you do your birthday celebrations right here? Make us part of it. Make us part of it. Everything you desire outside, we can contain it in the church. By the grace of God, the church has become so big to accommodate all of us. The secret to balancing your life spiritually, family, and all that is that make it one life so that you do not have multiple lives. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult to balance it. Sometimes when I'm in the office with my wife and kids, there is an agenda because they must appreciate what I'm going through. They must be part of it. There are some of the scripts I pass on to my wife. Can you help draft this for me? There are some of the books you have brought copies over there. If you look at those who co-edited, you will see my daughter, Nana, in it because I wanted her to be part of the journey. I have seen, I serve as a minister of the Church of Penguin, I've seen many ministers' children who are far away from what their parents are doing. My gentle advice is that this call is glorious, it's amazing. It was only when I accepted the call that I realized that those who are in it do not even appreciate what God, maybe for some, do not even appreciate what God has made out of them. It's a glorious opportunity. The best way is to integrate, make it one life. Bring your wife, bring your children, bring your family, everyone who comes around you into it and make them part of it. Then you have one life and it is not time consuming. Thank you. When God wants to use you for something, He orders your steps, and so He guides you into you finding the right woman to marry. That's right. I mean, you see, if you you marry the wrong person, it is difficult to please the person. It is extremely difficult for you to even explain to them what you are doing. But I have a very beautiful wife, and she's very calm. She's calm. She doesn't worry me. I've told her that the day she starts worrying me, I'll take her to Germany. <laughs> It doesn't worry. And I'll be telling her to look at uh, Dr. I've been telling her to look at Dr. Japon's wife. Uh, he's my boss. He, he trained me and he's helped me a lot. So I want to thank him. And I tell her that you see Mrs. Japon, she's cool, she's calm. You are like that. Please keep being like that. Because if you change, it worries us. So just keep being, just keep being who you are. So far, you have been good. Please don't change. And that, and she's, I don't think she's going to change. But what, what it is is that when it comes to family life, it's very important. I thank God that this time we have added Christian marriages and family life to the tenets and things that we do. We must involve families. Because when you read Genesis chapter 12, where Chairman started from yesterday, 1 to 4, the Bible says that Abraham was asked to leave his family. So people dwell on that, that, oh, you just leave the family and go. And then when you come down to four, the Bible says that he left and Lot went along with him. Even when he was leaving his father's house, he still went with somebody from the family. Then he went and in Genesis 24, one and four, the Bible says that when he was old, he asked the servant that go back to my family and get a wife for my son. That means that family is one of the things that are very important in life. And it is one of the things that you did not choose. So God places you there. And so for the family to grow, finding the right spouse is also very important. So that God's blessing can be generational. The problem with Christians is that we do not think about generational blessings and wealth. We think about today. But possessing the nation's agenda, it's a continuous process. We can't finish now. We do it and leave it for the next generation. So you bring your wife and your family in and let them understand that whatever you are doing, it's God first. When you do that, they will understand. And then you hand that over to them and then it will go on and on. So for me, I've always involved my wife when I'm going to church. Sometimes when I'm going for presbytery meetings, I carry her. When she was in the dickless, I carry her and then she'll sit in the car and then she'll be yawning and stuff like that. And then she'll say, and then thankfully she became a dickless. And so when we go for meetings, she's also in the meeting. And she's seen how stressful it is to be a presiding elder. And then my boss sends me, you know, we do waste. So we've been going to waste sites. And then let me just say that and end it. 
Then one of the days, we're going on a trip. Usually when I'm traveling, I'm like, oh, I'll go, I'll come back Saturday. Like, hey, so you, don't you have to ask? Okay, follow me. Then I took her, I took her to, Pearl, I'm sorry, but let me say this. I took her to uh, the Bola. We call it Bola. It's, uh, so I took her to the highest point, and it was raining. When she got there, she looked at the waist, and she said, hey, so this is where you have been coming? I said, yeah, this is where I bring the money from. Then she, <laughs> she, 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 she got to understand because those days you go to site, come back, and everything on you is stinking. You have to put it. She's going to do the washing and all that. But when you put them in and you're out there, they can figure out what you are doing. And you must let the woman trust you. Once your wife trusts you, you don't have a problem. So the double lives, men, if you want to have a successful business with your wife and all that, let them know your nature. Let them know that you are not double-sided. You are this. So when you are not at home and she calls and she doesn't get you, she's sure that as for you, you are safe. That is how we manage this thing. Thank you. That's so inspiring hearing um, because I think this is such an important subject of, of, of balance. Uh, I would just like to add, I think we also have to define what success is. You see, as a pastor, I can say I'm successful because my church is growing, because I've planted five churches. Um, but that's just one part of the life. If my marriage is not happy, then I'm not successful. If my kids do not want a relationship with me anymore, then I am not successful. We cannot focus success just on one area of our life. We have to look at our whole life say, are we successful? And um, so I was, I was in Berlin. We were together with maybe 80 to 100 people all involved in church planting or getting involved in church planting, a very important um, uh, meeting. And my daughter, she was um, celebrating her 30th birthday. And because she's still single, so I have a daughter, she's beautiful, and she's still, yeah, well. Um, uh, and, but I just had, she didn't, and she was celebrating her birthday, and I just felt in my heart, this is a big celebration for her, because her friends are celebrating their wedding, or their first child's birthday, and stuff, and this is now her celebration. So I told my ministry partners, I says, look, I'm going to leave early from this ministry, and I'm going to drive 600 kilometers down to the south, just to be with my daughter, just to honor her. So um, that's a way that I try to keep the balance. And just one last thing, I think there's a wonderful word in the Bible that helps us keep balance, and it's called Sabbath. And Sabbath just means stop. Sometimes we just have to stop doing things and just rest. We'll learn just to have a balanced view, otherwise the women on the audience will say, ah, Madam Moderator, you're not fair. So please tell us, how do you keep balance being, being, being a woman and doing the things that you do? I'm humbled that I'm the only woman on the panel <laughs> here. But as everybody had their submission earlier on with their introductions, what I found that was a common thread was most of them spoke about their mothers. Um, and I heard you mention, God bless mothers. I think you whispered that. And it just goes to show the power of women, right? If we look at the Bible, if we look at, you know, without, without Sarah, you know, Abraham's journey would not have been fulfilled, right? Without, without, um, without Mary, there would be no Jesus. Without Hannah, there would be no so every, I believe that there was every, you know, great man that we have in the Bible, there was a woman that God had shone a light on, right? So I believe that we as women have that role to play in our society and the spheres that we can also influence. Um, I myself, um, I was working for an investment bank in Switzerland, UBS, and I made it to director level at the age of 27. And... There, I was managing a global team of men, right? And it was, you know, I had to be able to use, tap into that grace that I've seen in the Bible, right? To be able to also manage in the best way the men that I was working with. And, you know, with what was mentioned with the mothers earlier on, I think the mothers and, and women, we have this special grace to multitask, 
We have this special grace to be able to handle different things. We have this special grace to listen. We have this special grace to be in a position and a posture.